It's lovely to see you all here this morning. Many faces I recognize, but there are some faces that I don't. And I just want to again welcome each and every one of you here. You know, we have a wonderful God. We have a God who loves us so much. And um, even though that we've had some people here who have been sick, who are here with us today, we praise the Lord and we thank him for his goodness. You know, we must have a strange dog at home. I enjoyed the story this morning. We have a black Labrador. Well, he's a black Labrador cross. And um, every so often we see him rushing across the paddock. And here's our little black kitten chasing him. He loves playing with our little black kitten, and it's amazing to see them just getting on so well together. It is a real joy to come here this morning and to worship together on God's Sabbath. It has been a real joy for me since coming to know the Lord and coming on His Sabbath and being able to just go, ah, it's the end of the week. I don't have to worry about all the things of the week. I can just come and say, Lord, thank you that we have this time to spend with you. Lou, I want to thank you for your prayers and the welcome too from Grant. But I need the Lord this morning because I'm only human. And so often I stand where the Lord needs to be. Would you please bow your heads with me this morning? Lord, we bow here this morning with thankfulness that you have set aside this day for us to come and spend with you, family, friends, but most of all to spend it in song, fellowship and worship with you. Thank you for this, Jesus. May the church say, Amen. You know... Back in, it must have been about 1991, Cedric and I had been married in 1990. And in 1991, the family came together. You see, my nana, Nana Young, was failing in health. And the two brothers and sister got together and realized that they needed to do something. They needed to tell Patrick. Patrick was the oldest in the family. But Patrick had realized, I'm sorry, had left home 20 odd years beforehand. And the family had lost contact with him. They didn't know where he was. There were rumours that he had gone over to Australia, rumours that he had gone down to the South Island, but these were only rumours. So the call went out to find Patrick. Days went by, weeks went by, and it was starting to get into months. But finally, finally the call came back Patrick's been found, and he's on his way. And when Patrick came, and he went into the bedroom of his mum, and she was now sleeping a lot, he sat down on the side of the bed. He took her hand in his, that wrinkled, arthritic hand. And when Nana next woke up, she saw his face. And I remember Nana, she had bluey grey eyes. And sometimes they could look at you very hard. And it was this particular day that Nana looked at Patrick very hard. And then she said, I know you. Do I know you? Yes, I know you. Jesus knows you and I individually. 
He is touched with the feeling of our frailties, our weaknesses. He knows each of you intimately. He knows everything about you. He knows the way you laugh. He knows the way you talk. He sees the tears that fall from your eyes. He knows your fears. And he knows the things that make you sorry. You and I are fully known by God. Our distresses touch his heart. When we cry out for aid, he is right there to help. I'm going to ask, please, that you turn with me in John chapter 12. John chapter 12 and verse 32. If you could turn those pages or your devices to John chapter 12. And verse 32. And there Jesus is saying, If I, if I am lifted up from earth, I will draw all peoples to myself. How many? All peoples to myself. Many refuse the invitation, but to those who gladly hear his call and surrender to his care, he says in John chapter 10, if we go back just a couple of chapters to John chapter 10, and we will look at verses 27 to 30. Here Jesus says something wonderful. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to take them. Out of my hand. I and the Father am one. Jesus cares. Jesus knows you. Let's turn to the Old Testament. We're going to Exodus chapter 33. Exodus chapter 33, verses 12 to 14. And there we read, Then Moses said to the Lord, Lord, you say to me, bring up this people. But Lord, you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet, Lord, you have said, I know you by name. And you have also found grace in my sight. Now, therefore, I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me, Lord, show me your way, that I may know you, Lord, that I may know you, and that I may find grace in your sight, and consider that this nation is your people. And he said, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Here was Moses asking, Who will go with me to do this, this work, this great work? And Jesus gave him the promise, I will go with you. I know you by name. I know what you need. You are not alone. And I will give you rest. Now, 
Let's look at verses 17 and 19 of the same chapter. Here the Lord is saying to Moses, I will also do this thing that you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. And he said, Please, show me your glory. And then he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. You see, we have a solid foundation of our hope. The promises of God are sure and firm. Please keep your finger in Exodus 33. We're going to be coming back there. But I want us to have a look at 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2. A couple of books before Hebrews. 2 Timothy chapter 2. In verse 19. There we read, nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal. Friends, this is the seal of God. The Lord knows those who are his. You see, the Lord knows your name. Let's look at Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. If you haven't already noticed, we're having a Bible study this morning. There are a few Bible texts to be looking through. So we're looking at Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. And there we read, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some think of slackness. But he is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish. What's it saying, friends? Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, I hope you kept your finger in Exodus because we're going back there. Exodus, and we're looking at chapter 34. Exodus chapter 34. And there we read in verses 6 and 7. And the Lord passed before him, Moses, and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and in truth keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. Remember how God put Moses in the cleft of a rock? And God passed by Moses, protecting him with his hand. And God showed Moses his glory. No one can see the face of God and live. But he showed Moses his glory. Our minds have been blinded, and we have looked upon God with fear and distrust. As a child growing up, I learned that God was somebody that was looking out to punish me whenever I did something wrong, was really there to just zap when I stepped out of line. Growing up to fear God and not understand him. We have thought of God as a God who is severe and unforgiving. A God whose character is stern. A severe judge who is harsh, just waiting for us to make a mistake. We picture the creator as being jealous 
taking joy in visiting judgments upon us. But friends, this is not the character of God. Instead, he came closer to us, his children, muddied with the blight of sin. Yes, God came closer to us through his son, Jesus Christ. And why did Jesus come? Jesus came to show us the Father. In redemption, God has revealed his love and sacrifice, but not the sacrifice of bulls and lambs. No, he came for the sacrifice of his own dear son, a sacrifice that tells us in Ephesians chapter 3. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 3. Turn with me, please, to Ephesians chapter 3. And verses 18 and 19. And there it reads, We may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. We can know the Lord Jesus Christ. We can know the Father who loves us so much. You all know the text in John 3.16. You know, when I first heard this text, oh, how my heart melted. For God so loved the world, say it with me, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. In John chapter 1 and verse 14, we read there, John chapter 1 and verse 14. And it reads there, The Word was made flesh, and the Word dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten Son, full of grace and truth. As we see in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. In Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 17, Hebrews 2 and verse 17, Therefore, in all all things he had to be made like his brethren that he might be a merciful and high priest in these things pertaining to God to make atonement for the sin of the people. Because Christ has to be made like us, he was able to draw you and I to his Father. Christ clothed his divine nature with the clothing of humanity and showed before all the other worlds and angels just how much God loves his children. Oh, how the angels looked in wonder. You and I are released from sin's dominion, which is over us when we commit ourselves fully to Christ, when we trust in him completely in all that he has done for us, no one else could become the sacrifice, not even the angels. Yes, Jesus clothed himself in the garbs of humanity. He became exactly like us. 
exactly like us, but sinless. Please turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 22. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 22. There it says, Jesus Christ, who committed no sin, nor was there any lie found in his mouth. Also in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, we read, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus Christ lived and died the life that was for you and me. That you and I may have the life that he deserved. Turn with me please to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 5. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes you and I are healed. You and I, through the sacrifice of Christ, are pardoned. You and I, through the sacrifice of Christ, are redeemed. We are saved. Can you say amen? He died so that the love of God as a mighty helper, would reach out to suffering mankind. In John chapter 1 and verse 18, no one has seen the Father at any time, only the begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father. He has declared him. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew 11 And verse 27. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Father but the Son, and no one knows the Son but the Father. In John chapter 14, we have an interesting story happening here. John chapter 14. Here we have Philip saying to the Lord, Lord, show us the Father. And that is enough for us. That is sufficient for us. We just want to know the Father. And Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words that I speak to you do not I speak on my own authority. But I speak with the authority of the Father who dwells in me. Jesus came to show us the Father, to show us how much we are loved. In Luke 4, 18, Luke chapter 4 and verse 18, And there we read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and to recover sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Friends, if you find yourself oppressed this morning, 
Jesus came for you. He came to free you. It is Satan who has spoken lies about God. It is Satan who oppresses, who wants to keep us slaves, who wants to destroy us. But Jesus came. Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted and free the captives. Jesus knows you. He knows you by name. Jesus showed mercy, grace, patience, goodness and truth. Jesus' heart and the Father's heart go out in tender sympathy to you and I. Jesus took on the nature of man that he might reach our hearts. He loves us so much that he came to reach out to you and I, came to break down those barriers that had been built up that we might know the Father. With a love that stood firm, Christ spoke to men the words that we find in John 17 and verse 3. John 17 verse 3. And there it says, To know God is eternal life. This means that eternal life is wrapped up in an intimate relationship with God. He knows you. He wants to spend time with you. He loves you so much. Let us go to John. And we're just starting to wrap up now. John chapter 6. So John chapter 6. Verses 60 to 70. Here we see a story. Jesus was talking to a multitude of people, which included a lot of disciples of his, as well as the twelve. And Jesus was saying to them, you need to eat my flesh and you need to drink my blood. And they said to him, that's a strange thing. And they didn't agree. And they turned away. You know, I remember our eldest daughter. Uh, she would have been about school age, maybe just coming up to five, maybe just on five. And the preacher of the day said, we need to eat our Bibles. And my daughter came over to me. She had been coloring in and she said, Mom. We have to eat our Bibles. The, the love of a child, taking it literally. Jesus was saying, you need to take me in. You need to open up your hearts to me and only to me. You need to eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. We had that wonderful service last week. Jesus Christ came to die for you and he came to die for me. Because he loves you with such a love. As we carry on with the story, Jesus turns to his disciples when everyone else left. And he said, will you too go? Can you imagine the Lord's heart? He's done all this for the people. And they turn away. Will you too turn away from me? And Peter, Peter says, O oh Lord, to whom shall we go? Lord, where do we go? Who do we go to? You have the words of eternal life, and only you can save.
Peter goes on to say, Also, Lord, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. In Ezekiel 33, verse 11, As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why would you die when I am here to give you eternal life? Why should you die, O house of Israel? Jesus was talking to the house of Israel, but you and I are spiritual Israel today. And he is saying the same thing to us today. Why would you die? Why won't you open up your hearts to me? I love you. I love you with an eternal love. God loves you. And he wants to live with you for eternity. He is a God who out of love gives you and I the opportunity to turn to him. Yes, friends, he knows you by name. Jesus knows you by name. And he loves each of us with a love that has no bounds. May you and I share this good news with those around us. May we also encourage one another with this. It's not long. It's not long and we will be going home. Jesus loves you. I would like to invite the singers to please come up the front.